welcome back to the 8-Bit Guy. So in this episode, I'm going to be restoring this Commodore 64. So you might be wondering, why a Commodore 64? <laughs> well, surprisingly, I've never actually restored one before. Sure, I've restored a VIC-20 and a Commodore 128, as well as the 128D <laughs> and a 116, and some of the Commodore PC clones and a bunch of disk drives. I've also done a Color Computer 1 and an Osborne, a Compact Portable, a Bell and Howell, an IBM PC Junior, along with the monitor, um, a Macintosh LC, as well as the monitor that goes with that, a Laser XT, a Macintosh Plus, and an Apple IIc, and so on. Okay, so I think you get the idea. I've restored quite a few computers on this channel, but never actually a Commodore 64. So I guess it's time to restore one. Um, this particular Commodore 64, along with this VIC-1541 disk drive, was actually donated to me by Edward Cassati. And there's a little bit of a fascinating story there. He actually bought a used home and the previous owner left a bunch of junk in, in some of the rooms. And he actually found these two items buried under a pile of junk. And uh, since he lives here in town, he actually offered to donate these items to me. And originally I declined, but then he said he was going to give them to Goodwill. So I thought about it and I'm like, well, okay, you know, I know somebody that I would like to have these. So I went ahead and uh, took them from him. And uh, of course, um, now that I'm looking at them, I see that they need a little bit of restoration work. However, upon closer examination, I realized that not only do these machines need some cosmetic attention, but the C64 is only partially working. The screen is lacking a bit in contrast, but that may be normal for this board revision. But the main issue is the cursor is missing, and as you can see, the keyboard doesn't do anything. Out of curiosity, I tried inserting a cartridge game, and as you can see, the game actually appears to work, but there's no input from the keyboard or joystick. Fortunately, I think this is a slam dunk case of a bad CIA chip, which is the chip that reads the keyboard and joystick. The reason the cursor is missing is because there's also a timer inside this chip that the kernel uses to determine when to flash the cursor, but since the timer isn't working, the cursor never flashes. We'll come back to this later, but for now, let's have a look at the cosmetic issues. There are a lot of scuffs and dirt on this that don't show up really well on camera, but are very visible in person. And obviously, it's missing the 6 key, and also apparently missing the power LED. On the bright side, Edward noticed these pieces laying next to the C64 when he found them, so he put them in a bag. This is our missing key, and unfortunately the key stock is broken off down inside of it. And I suspect this ring and sleeve is what holds the power LED in place, so we might be able to salvage that too. And last but not least, if we compare to another C64, it's pretty obvious this computer needs Retrobrite. So there's quite a few things to tackle here. Next, let's have a look at the drive he found with it. It's of the VIC-1541 variety. Now, these are less common than the matching gray version, but work just fine with the C64. The drive also has a lot of dirt and scuffs on it as well, but the more irritating part are these melted areas. It looks like something hot came in contact with the drive and just melted it. And there are tons of these little melted areas all over the drive. In the past, I always assumed these were caused by something hot, like a soldering iron accidentally coming into contact with the case. And that may very well be the cause. However, somebody recently explained to me that sometimes it isn't heat, but a chemical reaction from cables that are wrapped around it. Apparently, sometimes the rubber used for cables reacts with case plastics over a period of years while in storage and will cause these types of artifacts to appear. If that is the case, most likely it would be where there was enough pressure, such as something sitting on top of the drive, or in the case of the side here where the cable is wrapped around the corner. I dealt with this previously on a Commodore VIC-20 that I restored, and I'm still not sure what caused it on this one, but um, I was able to file it down and made it look about 90% better. But it was easy to file because of the curved nature of the VIC-20 case and the location of the burns. However, in this case, I need to try something else because it's too flat to use a file. I already know I'm going to need some chemicals, starting with glass cleaner, alcohol, and baking soda. So let's get started.
stage of cleaning is done, it doesn't look half bad. I managed to remove all the scuffs and black marks. Now let's start on the disk drive. Some of the scuffs on the dish wrap aren't coming off with alcohol, so time to move on to baking soda. So that looks a lot better without the scuffs, but we still have to do something about these melted spots. And for that, I'm going to try using this sanding attachment for my Dremel. I've never actually tried this before, so wish me luck. And of course I don't like breathing in plastic dust or getting it in my eyes, so I always suit up for this sort of thing. It does appear to be working. I would point out that a lot of what you're seeing in those vents is leftover baking soda, which I'll clean out shortly. Also, I sort of half expected this, but the disk drive needs a little bit of retrobrite as well, as you can see a different color plastic where I'm sanding. In retrospect, I probably wouldn't use this particular sanding attachment in the future, as it eats the plastic way too fast. I'd rather use something that gives me a little bit more time to work with it so I don't overshoot what I'm sanding. Okay, so I'm done with the Dremel, and these areas look quite a bit smoother and leveled off, but they feel very rough. I'll probably come back and sand these by hand a little bit. For the moment though, I wanted to deal with these little melted areas on the vents, and I'm hoping this razor knife will do the trick. And I do think it is working, but it's going to take a little time. Let me brush all the debris out of here. For comparison, uh, here's what it looked like before I started with the knife, and now after. So yeah, I'm pretty happy with that result, and I don't think these vents are ever going to look perfect, but they are definitely much improved. Okay, so now I'm going to hit these rough spots with some fine sandpaper. And this is definitely one of those times I really struggled to get this to show up on camera. I think you're just going to have to take my word for it, but sanding these areas by hand made a big difference in both the appearance and how it feels to the touch. And I can sort of demonstrate by showing you a before and after, so let's go back to this spot before sanding and now after. I think you can see at least part of what I mean. Okay, so I'll rinse this off a bit, and here's what the drive looks like now. This is remarkably better looking than before, but it will look even better after some Retrobrite. Moving back to the C64 itself, it's time to open it up, and the C64 and VIC-20 are both very easy to open with just three screws on the bottom, and it opens like so. As I suspected, the power LED was just laying down here, and I wanted to see if the LED was working, so I went ahead and plugged in the power to the computer, and yes, it does appear to work. That's good news. Now, I was kind of perplexed at first why the CIA chip looks like somebody had touched it recently. After all, this is the chip I suspect is bad, so I thought maybe somebody else had already figured that out before it got thrown in a pile of junk. However, upon closer inspection of my own video where I removed the keyboard, I realized that my own finger had smudged that dust earlier, so mystery solved. For the moment, I'm going to turn my attention to the keyboard and get it disassembled. And one of the things I struggle to show on camera sometimes is just how dirty something is. After all, this keyboard doesn't look too bad, does it? Not until I zoom in closer and you can see exactly what I'm talking about. As such, I'm going to remove all the keys so they can be properly cleaned. And fortunately, I don't know how I did this, but somehow I broke another plunger when trying to pull the shift key off. I've never done this before, at least as far as I can remember. So now I have two of these keys to fix. Well. Let's get the rest of the keys off and hopefully I won't break any more. I always save the space bar until last because it's easier to remove when there are no other keys next to it. Also a word of warning, be sure to store this spring separately from the rest as it is a stiffer spring just for the space bar. And of course this part here is pretty dirty, but we'll deal with that later. 
I need to remove this bottom PCB here, but in order to do that I have to desolder the shift key. Now, this is actually pretty easy. All you have to do is heat up the solder and then pull these little wires out. And we'll do the reverse when it comes time to put it back together. And now to remove all these little screws. And there we go. And I've located the shift key with the broken plunger. So I'll pull that out and you can see what that looks like. And here's the broken plunger for the 6 key. To fix these keys, I went over to my brother's house. I also get to visit my pet, which lives in his little museum since I don't have room for it. And the first order of business was to 3D print a couple of new plungers. Now my brother found uh, one on Thingiverse, so there was no need to design one. And away it goes. We'll check back on this in a little bit. In the meantime, we made use of this drill press to carefully drill down into the broken plastic of the 6 key. And now the shift key too. And the idea is here to run a little screw down into the broken piece like this. And with any luck, we can pull it out. And it worked. Uh, here's our little extracted piece. Now time for the other key. This one was a bit harder to do. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> but it worked. Okay, let's go check on the 3D printer. It looks like it's getting close. Also, in case you didn't notice, we did a 100% infill on this, so these parts will be strong. And there we go, all done. Just need to pop these off the raft, and a quick test fit for the key. Yep, looks good. Okay, so something else we have to do is remove these little pieces. These are actually the carbon contacts, and they actually pop out like this. Okay, so all I gotta do now is then take this piece and kind of wrap it in there. And now I'll stick the new plunger down in there. Seems to fit okay. And while I have it out, I'll go ahead and clean this PCB with some alcohol. And now time to reattach it to the rest of the keyboard. And now, to take care of this nasty dust and dirt. There we go, that looks a lot better. And finally, I can start the laborious task of cleaning all five sides of every key. On the bright side, there isn't anything sticky or gooey on these, so it goes pretty fast. Time to reattach the space bar. I always clean this piece of metal and then I try to gently coat it with some lithium grease. And don't forget the special spring for the space bar. And there we go, perfect. I want to go ahead and start with the 6 key to see how the 3D printed plunger works. Well, it seems to work, but I noticed it's a bit more bobbly before. It shakes like a bobblehead after pressing it. Well, I guess we'll have to see how it works when it's all done. So I always like to save the Commodore key for last, but I ran into a problem I didn't anticipate. And I guess I should have, but I have no spring for this because the six key never came with one to begin with. And so I'm short of springs. So now I gotta go find one. Okay, so I have this spare ugly Commodore 64 keyboard that I've used for spare parts in the past. I'm gonna go ahead and take a key off of it so that I can salvage the spring. Now, you might obviously want to know, why didn't I just go ahead and get the plunger out of this too if I had a spare keyboard? And I could have, and I very well might end up doing that, but I actually just kind of wanted to see what a 3D printed part would be like as a replacement parts, because you know these parts are getting more rare uh, every day that goes by, so I just kind of wanted to see how they work, but if I'm not happy with them, I might have to actually uh, replace the plungers from my spare keyboard. And so here goes the final key. Voila. So I need to retrobrite these case pieces, but as you can see, the weather outside this time of year just isn't going to cooperate. In fact, looking at the forecast, you can see it isn't going to be better anytime soon. Totally off topic, do you see these four weird light colored patches on my driveway? 
It only shows up this way when it's wet. Uh, just as an example, here's a picture from one of my security cameras. And if I go back a few days ago when everything was dry, you'll see that looks very different. And so I've always wondered what on earth caused this, and I think I finally figured it out. So if we go back a few days ago, here I am washing my wife's car, and you can see those colored areas line up right under the car's tires. Well, I eventually figured out that it's the black magic stuff I use on the tires to make them shine, and every time I use that stuff, I get a little bit on the concrete. Heck, you can see me using that like 13 years ago on my Eagle Talon in the exact same spot, because that's where I always wash cars. <laughs> And so this stuff repels water, and I think that's why it looks that way. Um, anyway, not that this had anything at all to do with the C64 restoration, but I like solved mysteries, and I thought you might too. In a previous RetroBrite episode, you can see the contraption I came up with for indoor RetroBriting using a single fluorescent blacklight and some foil. Well, this method worked, but took way longer than expected, almost a week if memory serves. Also, I had issues with the aluminum tape I put inside the crate, which had a galvanic reaction with the steel and brass parts that were laying on top of it, which I think hampered the whole process. So I wanted to try something a little different this time. I'm headed out to Target to look for the perfect size crate for the C64 pieces, and as you can see, they have quite a few different sizes and shapes to pick from. And I think this particular one here is the one I'm going to pick. You see, I wanted to build some sort of custom retro writing tank, but one of the problems I kept coming up against is I didn't want to have to pick a specific size. You see, if the tank were too small, then I wouldn't be able to fit the larger objects in there, but if the tank were too big, then um, it would be kind of a waste of chemicals and a waste of space when using on smaller objects. So I really wanted a system that was reconfigurable for different sizes of objects. I had seen this video done by Odd Tinkering on his channel where he wrapped the container in UV strip lights, and I assumed that this container was transparent to UV light, or at least UVA. Anyway, it worked out pretty well for him, and this seemed like a setup that could scale to different sized containers. Okay, so it looks like this crate is just about right for the C64 case part, so the first thing I wanted to do was test if this plastic was transparent to UVA. And the way I'm going to do that is by shining a UV light on this post-it note, which is very fluorescent, and then I'll try shining it through the crate. As you can see, some of the light gets through, but some of it also reflected, so this isn't perfect. Glass might work better, but we'll give it a shot. Um, I'll get this label pulled off. Okay, now I want to show you this guy. Now this is a very heavy duty UV light. These are really the kind that they would use like on a stage or something. This thing's really heavy. The back of it's like all metal. And uh, it's got a little stand here or this is also a mounting bracket. And uh, this thing outputs uh, 60 watts. Actually that's, that's actually the amount of power it consumes is 60 watts. Uh, I don't even know what the number of lumens is, but uh, this thing is, uh, ridiculously bright, bright. So let me uh, plug it in and show you right quick. Okay, so um, there's actually very uh, big warnings that come with this saying not to look directly into this light when it comes on, probably because there's such a vast amount of UV light coming out of it, even though you can't see all of it. So I'm going to kind of turn it to the side here. And uh, yeah, see it lights up my post-it note pretty well. Let's see how it lights up through the plastic. Yep, it, uh, it gets through, but I feel like about 50% of the light is blocked or at least diffused by the plastic. You know, the other thing I want to mention is that I can put my hand in front of this and feel heat. I mean, this, even though there's not supposed to be any infrared coming from this, there's just a surprising amount of heat that I can feel. I mean, that just gives you the idea of the amount of UV power this thing is putting out. It's probably going to give me cancer. Okay, so let's get started. I have the light suspended just above the crate. I'm going to fill this with hot water from the sink. Of course, I only need enough water to submerge the part I'm working on. Then comes the hydrogen peroxide. Then I'll slide this under these three lights. I actually have six of them, but I'm just going to use three at the moment. And let's turn them on. Holy cow! It's so bright in my studio. It doesn't look like it because my camera is trying to compensate by turning down the exposure, but everything in my studio that's even slightly fluorescent is blindingly bright. Don't worry, I won't be staying in this room while this process is going on. Okay, so two hours has passed and I want to inspect the progress. I've been checking on it every 30 minutes, but this is the first time to take it out of the water so I can get a close inspection. I'm really blown away by this because at first glance, it looks like it's already done. I'm going to run this uh, to the bathtub right quick and rinse it off. Okay, so it's rinsed and now I'm drying it off. Now I want to compare with the other piece. I might could have actually done these pieces at the same time, but I wanted to keep one half as a control so I could see any progress that was happening since this is a new experiment for me. 
Anyway, yeah, you can clearly see it's worked. In fact, I'd say it's about 90% done, in two hours no less. I'm going to put it back in there for another hour or so, since the sides were just a little brown still. And so here we are, one hour later, so that's three hours total in the treatment. And by the way, even if you can't see it from this distance, if I zoom in you'll see it's covered in bubbles, so this is always something to be aware of because it will eventually float to the top. So anyway, I'm going to run this to the bathtub again for a rinse. And I'm pretty sure this piece is done. Three hours is probably a record for me, and it's actually faster than what I could have probably done on a sunny day in the middle of summer. Granted, this plastic wasn't nearly as yellowed or brown as some of the others I've done in the past. I'd probably better compare to my other C64 to see if it's the color it should be. And it looks like it is. So, yeah, I'd say the top part's a success. Now I better start on the bottom part. And here we go again with a nuclear blast for three hours. And here we are three hours later. I'm going to stick these together for a comparison. At first glance, they look like a good match, but upon a closer inspection, I see a very minor difference. I don't think anyone would even notice if they weren't looking for it, so I'm going to call this done as this video has taken way longer than expected already. Moving on to the disk drive. I need to take this thing apart anyway because I knew I got baking soda in the vents and between the cracks and stuff, so I needed to rinse it off anyway. But I figure I could devote a few hours to retrowriting these too. I don't think the drive was nearly as bad off as the computer, so don't expect a huge change. And here we go, three hours later. Yeah, I can see a small difference in the top and bottom shell. Not huge though. I'll go ahead and do the bottom part next. And while the drive is apart, I'll do a little cleaning and maintenance in here, starting with some compressed air. And I want to clean the head, so I'll need to remove the logic board. And as always, I'll reload the rails. The drive is essentially done now, I just need to reassemble it. Now to reassemble the C64, including this power LED. And we can't forget about this bad CIA chip, which I'll go ahead and remove now. And I have this replacement I got from ArcadeComponents.com. It is surprising how many people think I have a stockpile of replacement parts, but I don't. I have to find them from other people, just like everyone else. Okay, let's test this thing and see if my diagnosis was correct. Well, nothing blew up. And <laughs> looky there, I can see a flashing cursor. Uh, let's go ahead and reattach the keyboard so we can test that. And that also appears to be working. I think we're in business. So I'd call this a pretty successful restoration of a Commodore 64, and this is the very first 64 I've ever actually restored, even though people think I've done like hundreds of them <laughs> or something like that. There is one thing I'm going to do though before I give this away. Um, I'm actually going to take this back apart, you know, off camera after we're done with this, and I'm going to replace those two plungers with the one from my spare keyboard. And um, even though the new plungers actually work, I just don't care for bubblehead keys. So. <laughs> So I'm going to change those out, it'll only take a few minutes, and then I'm going to, going to go ahead and give this away. But uh, that actually wraps it up for the moment. So um, as always, thanks for watching.